We're not asking Intel to start using liquid metal in today's content. That's not really viable, not en masse, but we hope that this testing will help prove the significant thermal detriment faced by Intel's high-end desktop CPUs for using low-end thermal compound. We're focusing part one of this testing on the 7900X, and we'll expand testing shortly hereafter. Intel has all of the overclocking headroom in the world on their CPUs, but the usage of a poor thermal interface material means that much of this is lost to thermal limitations. Ignoring overclocking, even mainstream users must also buy higher-end coolers, often 280 millimeters or up, just to keep temperatures reasonable within a case especially, while still considering noise. With better thermal media, Intel could reduce the hidden cost of the cooler and allow users to operate at lower noise levels. This video is brought to you by the Be Quiet Dark Base Pro 900 White Edition. The DBP900 marks a return to full tower cases, equipped with ample hard drive support, effective noise damping foam, high performance fans, and the option to be inverted into an alternative layout. Learn more at the link in the description below. There are valid reasons for Intel to use the thermal interface they do. They use stuff from Dow Corning. It's pretty good for longevity. It has a high durability to thermal cycling, which is what you care about. You care about making sure that when cycling temperatures rapidly or on and off over many years of use, the interface isn't going to crack and leave you with a processor that is inoperable. So it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off between that and something else. Solder has some arguments for and against it. We don't have any actual data to back any of those up because Intel doesn't publish those, AMD doesn't publish those, no one talks about it. But there are alternatives to what Intel uses now and either better thermal paste or a solder of some kind or something like that. But ultimately the current method is limiting Intel's CPUs in overclocking, which is really unfortunate because they are strong overclockers. And even beyond that, if you look at the cooler requirements, there's this hidden cost with Intel high-end CPUs where if you want it to operate with relative silence, you really have to start investing in coolers more so than if you bought, well, more so than if you replace the compound with liquid metal like we did or just something better than the stuff that's on there now. And to Intel's credit, there may be reasons they've gone with Tim outside of just it's cheaper. Maybe there's some kind of engineering challenge. Maybe there's something to do with the uh, various grants that are afforded by the governments for things like being environmentally friendly, which Tim is going to be theoretically more environmentally friendly than solder. Maybe there's something there. But from an enthusiast perspective, there's better performance that could be had out of the CPUs and there's better Tim out there. So we're gonna explore that today, walk through the steps of delitting the processor, applying liquid metal, and showing the differences. And again, we're not asking Intel to go and start applying liquid metal to their CPUs. It's just, it moves around too much. It's not really good for shipping. It kind of needs to be replaced every now and then. But this is as a stand-in for an alternative like solder, which is a lot more realistic, is currently used on AMD CPUs, has been used by Intel in the past. Uh, and that's kind of what we're using as an analog today for a high-end interface. So we'll be walking through that. Now, delitting, we use Der Bauer's Delid Dimate X. We are using that for some other upcoming content as well, and it'll be part two of this exploration. We're using a uh, Conduct Knot Thermal Grizzly material for the liquid metal, and we'll have more information on the testing process in the article below. But the big part is that we're using Prime95 and Blender. Prime95 thermal, or power cycles rather. So when it power cycles, you'll see stepping where the thermal charts will kind of go like this, then like that, and then maybe back down. And that's because they are cycling power loads. It's pretty predictable. You can tell it what to do. So uh, that's a good test for something intensive. Blender is a good workload. That's constant power throughput, the same power throughput, the same workload type, the same everything. So Blender is really consistent for that. So we've got a bit of each and we'll be exploring the thermals from each of those types of tests. We're starting with the most abusive and exaggerated test, and then we'll move on to Blender and lower frequency testing. With Prime95 running at 4.5 gigahertz and with a 1.175 voltage ID, we end up throttling on the CPU that's cooled with Intel stock thermal paste. Some cores are hitting the TJ Maxx of 105C, causing power throttling that we can show on our current clamp, and we will momentarily. 
And keep in mind that the thermal differences here would be shown to an even greater degree if we hadn't been thermal throttling with the TIM on the CPU. Still, we're at 99 Celsius peak steady state temperature with TIM and 85 to 86 degrees Celsius with liquid metal. And again, that's ignoring the fact that the TIM version is thermal throttling. So the differences would be greater. And either way, this is a reduction of 15C now without the thermal throttling consideration. And we'll show more on that later. Moving to a 360 millimeter thermal take flow radiator doesn't appear to help us much when using TIM as we're still throttling and hitting 100 Celsius temperatures, but the throttling isn't as bad and we'll show that in our frequency plot. But still, the CPU is at 100 degrees Celsius average. The 360 millimeter radiator helps in other instances, which we'll show more in part two of this content, but that's just not enough here. Prime is abusive and we can survive with Blender sometimes, but that's about it. Liquid temperatures are sort of a question mark for us. Our original hypothesis was that liquid temperatures would increase with greater thermal transferability between the IHS and dye, but we're not measuring that here. There's only one of a dozen tests in this particular plot, but we've got many more coming in part two, and that has the liquid temperatures roughly matched, and that's when the power load is lower, Shown here, the CPUs are thermal stepping along with Prime's power cycling, with each relatively aligned. Data alignment is handled prior to number averaging anyway, but you can see the stepping here. The liquid temperature ramps faster on the 7900X with TIM, as does the core temperature. And when we look at the power chart, we're showing severe throttling on the unit with TIM, but applying liquid metal brought down our temperatures enough to avoid throttling as a result of thermals. So we can see these boosted power consumption figures as measured at the EPS 12 volt cables because of the limitation that existed with the TIM unit. This frequency plot shows the severity of the problem. We're able to achieve higher clocks and hold them with liquid metal, which speaks to the uselessness of Intel's TIM when overclocking. It's unfortunate too, because Intel has the best overclocking candidates right now and performance jumps as much as 30% when running our CPUs with high OCs and liquid metal, and we can easily get another 200 megahertz out of the clock by switching thermal interfaces. So it's a real shame to see Intel squander their advantages in an increasingly competitive market. This is something they're good at. Overclocking is one of their strengths. And yet when AMD is competing fiercely, Intel still has parts that are choking their own advantages and needlessly so. So that's disappointing to see. It's unfortunate that you need increasingly better coolers and louder outputs just to hold on to these higher clocks that are so easily attained. It's not like we're doing liquid nitrogen overclocking here. We're not doing anything exotic. We're just increasing the multiplier and the VID both to levels that are perfectly within reason, but in order to sustain them, you need loud or big liquid coolers and it's just not necessary. And it's unfortunate the liquid metal shows that it's not necessary. Moving on to our 4.5 gigahertz overclock with a 1.175 voltage ID, we couldn't reasonably pass the blender render without the help of maglev fans and a 360 millimeter cooler. We otherwise entered throttle territory. This is especially true if you consider that we're testing on an open air bench at around 24 degrees Celsius. That's like room temperature. Testing in a case, you'd easily bring internal ambient temperatures up to 40 C. That's why this is important. That's why we're trying to convey to Intel to use better interface, whether it's Tim or something else. The CPU has all the potential in it, but it'll thermal throttle quickly if using the stock Tim. It's squandered and we're not sure why. It could be process or it could be money, but Intel has done better materials in the past and they can do it again. Looking at the numbers, we're at 63 degrees Celsius with liquid metal and a 280 millimeter cooler with NZXT stock fans. They're not even very good fans. With thermal paste, the CPU was hitting 73 degrees Celsius on a 360 millimeter cooler with three Corsair Maglev fans at max RPM. These are some of the best fans you can buy on what is approaching unreasonably large cooler sizes and the cooler setup was nearing 60 dBA during testing. Even when it passes, it's just unacceptably loud. And that's a 10 degree difference that favors the liquid metal mod when using a worse cooler with worse fans. 
That's what this is about. Intel is creating a hidden cost to its CPUs. More noise and more money to get things cooled under overclocks, and it's awfully unfortunate. It's just painful to see such a good overclocking CPU, such a huge advantage, thrown away. The CPUs can overclock exceptionally well to the point that they get fiercely competitive, more than they already are, and it's just squandered. Just to prove a point, let's lower the clocks closer to stock, just so there's no argument from Intel's end or anywhere else that we're doing something unreasonable by overclocking. So looking now at a locked frequency of 3.6 gigahertz all core and locking voltage to 1.15 VID, yes, it's a little higher than necessary, but it won't change, and that's the point. Using auto testing, for example, you can see improvements, but auto moves voltages around based on need. It moves a lot of things around based on need. So fixing the voltage to 1.15 VID means that we can completely control the environment. That's what we're going for. Anyway, with this chart, we're showing liquid metal dragging down temperatures to around 68 degrees Celsius with the liquid temperatures now more evenly matched. So this makes a bit more sense. We think that this liquid temperature difference in the original chart might have something to do with some sort of non-linear tripping point for either the cooler or the CPU, where CPU temperatures of more than 100 degrees Celsius start to cause some sort of runaway scenario. We're really not sure. We've been talking to people. We don't know why the liquid delta was so great in some tests that were heavily overclocked, but not in the others. But either way, that's something we'll explore more in part two of this content, which is coming out within a few days. Regardless, the difference here is 80 degrees Celsius on the TIM unit versus 68 degrees Celsius on the liquid metal unit and with the X62, and that's without any overclocking, mind you. That's a reduction of 12 degrees Celsius, again, without overclocking, without serious overvolts, and as we saw earlier, the temperatures further scale with higher power throughput. Liquid temperatures here are with a margin of test error and variance, but as we begin to overclock and overvolt, that starts to run away a little bit. Next is Blender. So this is another chart. This one's continuing the lower clock 3.6 gigahertz fixed and 1.15 VID test with Blender, where we see about a 10 degrees Celsius improvement on the liquid metal version. Liquid temperatures are again with an error, so are effectively equal. We're about 51 to 52 degrees Celsius measured on the liquid metal version of the CPU, the 7900X and about 61 degrees Celsius on the TIM version, another 10 degree difference for a lower frequency, lower voltage workload. So even without overclocking, you've got advantages that are significant. Here's a look at power consumption for this test. We're consistently drawing 212 to 214 watts down the EPS 12 volt cables with TIM and running about 205 on the liquid metal mod. We need to do more testing to understand if this is just normal variance and error, or if this is more repeatable, this could be a power leakage reduction like we saw with Vega Frontier Edition and an efficiency improvement, or it could be within margin of error. We're not sure right now. Here's the test over time. Results are consistent. We're at about 50 to 52 degrees Celsius steady state with liquid metal and about 60 to 62 Celsius steady state with Tim. And I hope I'm making my point clearly here. I mean, again, Intel, this isn't just about overclocking. It's not just about appealing to your 1% of users who push these CPUs as far as we might, or as far as someone more extreme like Der Bauer might, or Buildzoid might. This is about doing something that makes your product better, tap into its performance in a greater way, and improves the brand credibility, to throw a buzzword in there, to a point where it, it, just, it stops some of the criticism, and from a mainstream user perspective, you can now reduce the requirement of the cooler down to something like a 240 or a high-end air cooler, get rid of the high RPM, loud fans that, I mean, I'll put a chart on the screen. We do cooler testing. The coolers I've highlighted now are the ones that would do best with these CPUs at the noise levels that we're showing on this chart. And it's just, it's louder than necessary. It's more expensive than necessary. So now your parts that have been criticized for price even if it's a fair price perhaps, have a hidden cost of an extra X dollars for a better cooler. That's a serious consideration for mainstream non-enthusiast users. But a lot of buyers of these products are enthusiasts or a lot of buyers of these products are workstation users and they have either noise concerns or just why would you spend more than you should concerns. So we're not asking Intel to do liquid metal for their CPUs, but 
it'd be nice to see either an improvement in the thermal interface to use, maybe a different one from the Dow Corning stuff that's used now, or a consideration of going back to solder, which would solve all these problems. You'd put Der Bauer's D-Lid Dimates out of business, unfortunately. But, I mean, I spoke with Der Bauer about that at Computex, and even he was like, hey man, that would make my job a lot easier. So I'm okay with that. Everyone wants to see a better interface. And Intel, although our contacts say they listen, and I appreciate that, you know who you are. Thank you for listening. It just, it doesn't get that far up the chain. So we decided to try and prove a point here. D-Lid stuff, use liquid metal as the analog to a better material and show the potential for improvement and show where these CPUs can go. I mean, again, I, I can't talk about all the data today, but we're seeing at least 100 megahertz improvement across the board in overclocks. And in a couple cases, we were getting an extra two to 300 megahertz by going to liquid metal and we could even drop the cooler requirement down. So that's a big deal. Uh, you're talking 4.8 gigahertz versus 4.5. And yeah, you can push the voltage a bit higher too, because now you can go up to 1.25 or 1.24, but that increases the power throughput, that increases the temperature, that increases the, uh, the thermal requirement of the cooler in terms of what it can handle. So that's what this comes down to is with a better interface like liquid metal, you can overclock higher, you can keep the CPU cooler than the lower overclock and it'll be quieter and the cooler will be cheaper. So guys, it's like you win in every category by doing this. I don't know. Uh, that's so yeah, anyway, obviously we're still traveling or at least traveling again. I should say I'll be back home soon and Andrew will be home soon. He'll be editing videos soon. We'll have a lot more on this topic, so subscribe if you're not already. You can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. It's a, it's a big help at this point because we do these types of videos. And um, I mean, again, I, I'm not trying to, <laughs> to like make enemies with these companies, but this it just seems like such an easy thing to improve your product in significant ways. Even just on the media side, think of the praise you would get Think of the reviews with the higher overclocks. People just overclock to the highest they can get, benchmark it, and review based on that clock and based on stock. If suddenly you can go two or 300 megahertz higher, even 200 megahertz higher, that's a big deal. So, especially when you have competition now, like real competition for the first time in years. Anyway, yeah, patreon.com slash gamersnexus helps out directly. Subscribe for more. Thank you for watching. Uh, hopefully we'll not be shooting in a hotel room soon. I'll see you all next time.